Hi, Baloji. So, hi, Alex. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Cool. So today we are interview interviewing you first to learn a bit more about yourself before the symposium. Uh, Global Africa's Congolese literature, music, and art in the 21st century that the Winter King uh, Institute is organizing at Florida State. And during this symposium, you will continue reflecting on your artistic practice and more generally on the place of the artists and their practice during a global pandemic, right? So today we have the chance to have you with us to answer a few preliminary questions in order to know you better and understand a bit more of your world before the conference. So let me start with one question about your name, Baloji. We had a conversation recently about its meaning and the evolution of your relationship with the name itself. Can you tell us more about this and also the reasons why you choose it as your artist's name? I'm thinking as, for instance, why not Baloji Chiani, like your cousin, uh, right? Your cousin Sami yeah, Baloji yeah. is using his whole name. So why, what's your relationship with the name and why do you choose just Baloji? Oh, um... Yeah, first and foremost, uh, I hate my name. <laughs> so this uh, Baloji is my first name, prénom, what you say, prénom? Mm -hmm. It's my first name. Uh, I received it in honor of somebody that helped my dad. So I received that name, which is very hard to handle because in Swahili and Chiluba, which is two of the main language uh, that people speak in DRC, Congo DRC, it means Baloji means Muloji mean a sorcerer and Baloji mean a group of sorcerer or a sorcerer who can take the power of other sorcerer to be stronger. So I always compared its name to be called devil or demon in the in European culture. It's super hard to, to live with this name. So all my life I hated my name. And uh, I try to get like, um, when I get Belgian passport, I try to remove it from my passport, uh, but it was too expensive. I, it was like 3000 euro, I could not afford it. Um, so I decided to keep it. And in a way to accept it a little bit who I am, I say it's, I have to accept my name as well. So I kept that name. And I don't want, and it's always been my name, Baloji, without family name. And I know that, for example, in cinema, they want me to have a family name. Like we say, Baloji Chani, and I say, no, that's, my name is just Baloji. And I don't want to carry the name of my dad as an artist name or whatever. My name is just Baloji, so. Okay, thank you. Um, you have a very rich background too, starting with the rap band Star Flam, right? Before moving on to a solo career, you released several albums and now also several short music videos, a short yeah. movie. Uh, you're working on a long movie, right? Now um, yeah, I'm working on a feature film, yeah. A feature film, and you've also done some acting, if I remember correctly, right? Yes. So in a recent post on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, you mentioned the different professional labels that can be associated to your work. Uh, and how do you navigate these different roles in the creative act? And how do you make a whole of all of these different skills that you have, like the musicians, the rapper, the mm -hmm. director, actor, everything you can do? I will say that I have just one job <laughs> and it's on the little bit, it's funny because now it sounds, uh, it can sound arrogant. And 10 years ago, it sounds so cliche, almost like childish. Uh, when I was saying I'm doing poetry and I think I'm still doing poetry and this is my main job is <laughs> poetry. Is it the, uh, the inheritance of Sonila Boutansi's? Yeah, in this heritage, in this uh -huh. tradition and, and poetry is a way of telling narrative and stories by using metaphor and using structure a narrative structure that is different than a book. And I, I, I extend that work in, like we call it, uh, you call that in English, poetry in motion uh, by film. Uh, I think my film has that little bit of poetic type of narrative, very photographic, uh, very mixing a lot of absurd, uh, magical realism type of uh, 
proposition. So um, it's an extension. It just go hand in hand, and you just he just tell stories. And sometimes they go into songs. This sometimes they go into short films. Sometimes they go in jewelry. And I don't know. It it, it doesn't matter. The, it just it just take the shapes that your your ideas need. Would you say that because of this, your work is at least partly autobiographical? Yeah, it's a big part. I think uh, I think as an artist, who you are has a big impact on the work that you can uh, propose to people. Uh, they say, for example, for uh, I read something about Tarantino in the state that Tarantino has nothing to say, but he said better than anybody else. Mm. And I really appreciate that that thinking because he can be a, a fantastic technician, but doesn't mean that he has a story to tell or the need to tell the story. And I think with my background, with my history, family, family history, <laughs> personal history, I have a lot of story that I would like to share to the world. And uh, uh, it's a strength. It is also a weakness because it, everything is so personal and dear to you and yeah. Okay. And your work often investigates the notion of color, right? Skin color, but also the color in more generic terms. I'm thinking, for instance, about the colors on your albums, right? Where you have several parts, and each part is a different color. Uh, yeah. Also, the short movie, Peau de Chagrin, Bleu de Nuit, with, or the clip, Define Beauty, where the notion of darkness and light are being interrogated. Uh, for instance, with the notion of the light of the sun and, you know, the darkness. Yeah. Can you develop a bit more on this point and how you consider the notion of color in your work and also where does this come from? Uh, it comes from the fact that I'm doing synesthesia, so I'm associating sounds and color, I'm associating shapes and colors, structures and color, atmosphere and colors. <laughs> and it's not the easiest thing to live with, but in, in my work, it, it forced me to have a structure, to respect that structure. And um, so, I'll, for example, for the album, I decide certain keys were connected to the color blue. So I only work on songs in those key harmonies, keys, when I mean keys. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's limit, limiting the, the, the spectrum of work, of possibilities, but it also forces you to dig deeper, to make better selection and to really take time to craft your work with your obsessions. <laughs> so it's hard to deal with it on, on a daily basis, but uh, I try to make it part of my identity as a, as a musician. Uh, I'm working now on a new project. It's again connected with colors <laughs> and same for the, um, for the film, uh, like you mentioned, Bleu de Nuit. This all color. This I have another movie called Zombie, which is mainly in yellow. So everything has connected to yellow elements, and um, yeah, <laughs> it's quite demanding. But it's I cannot do anything about it. That's so fascinating. Do you associate these colors with uh, also? Uh, you're from Lubumbashi, right? And do you associate some of the colors from the city you're from in in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in all the region? Yeah, it's connected, uh, and I think it's coming from there. Uh, mm -hmm. from the, the way, uh, yeah, Lubumbashi is such a. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to a friend and telling her that Lubumbashi, if you put it on an American perspective, could be like a city like Los Angeles that doesn't really have mm -hmm. a center. Yeah, um, which is. I think in the American perspective, it's quite unique to have a city that the downtown LA is like random and everything happened outside. Everything is oriented for the outside, from the desert, for all this part of the cities. Uh, 
to, to the opposition of a city like Kinshasa, which is more like New York City type of energy, like mm -hmm. a big megapole and a lot of people. Um, so of course it has an impact on me. And, uh, and most of my work is also connected to uh, places. Mm -hmm. uh, places has a lot of impact. So colors and location, place, and that, that I don't know how to say this, but a, a place can also be a part of you and has an impact on you and a city can be a character, can be a mm. person. I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah. It's, Crazy. yeah. Right. Uh, this question is a bit like, uh, off track, but do you know the short movie Chien Bleu by Fanny Liatar and Jeremy Trouille, which was... I don't know it. <laughs> so, because I think it's fascinating because it's also a movie hyper-fixating on the color blue. And so I was just wondering if there was some connection because the short movie was released the same year. No, I don't know about it. But it, it's, it's connected to the... Um, uh, blue is a warm color? No. I don't think so. Yeah, I didn't think of that one. Because well. it's also that's an older movie. Uh, also, yeah, uh, a, a movie, but it, it came from a from a book, a comic book, um, and it's interesting to take uh, blue as a warm color. Uh, it's something that really fascinated me. That uh, mm. we can use color in different ways. Uh, for example, for my film now, I'm working on on kids on the situation on the um, orphans, uh, kids that get uh, abandoned, and I see them pink. Okay. <laughs> and in a way, when I, when I do research, I see that pink was the color for the boys uh, before uh, the Queen Grace from Monaco start wearing uh, her daughter in pink. And then the whole world changed and put pink to girls, but pink was a, a boyish color and now if you see pink it's on the boy it's like what's wrong with him it has a gender crisis or something yeah. so i, I, I think it's interesting wrong, yeah it, i think it's, it's interesting to challenge all the perspective that we have on colors that red is connected to certain things with violence with dynamic um pink is a girly soft color stuff like that. Blue is a cold color. Yeah, I think it's interesting to change that. I think music is a good medium to kind of switch the paradigm, right? Yeah, because yeah just... it's, it's like doing a, a happy song with minor chords. <laughs> it's like... Which can be done, right? Yeah, it's been done by so many people. The Beatles, for example, <laughs> right. and, uh, and b billions of other people. But it's interesting because it's made for sad songs and if you, if you change it and you play it differently, change the whole perspective. So it's very interesting. Cool. Thank you. If I remember correctly, Peau de Chagrin does not really have any association with the Balzac novel, La Peau de Chagrin. No. And I found also this coincidence quite fascinating. And I would like to you to tell us more about the reason why you chose this title, Peau de Chagrin, for the song. And, and it's meaning for the song and the video also going with it. For me, it's it's coming from the French wordplay coming from Balzac, obviously. Um, reduce, réduire uh, peau de chagrin, so so it's reduced to nothing, mm -hmm. and and it's like about skin uh, contact, two bodies in contact, that moment where. Mm -hmm. There is nothing else between these two bodies, um, except maybe some pain, some sorrow, some misunderstanding. So this this old song and the video talk about how lovers um, magnify their first times together, and they don't accept that the partner can change, and they think that it's still the same person because your brain, in a way. Mm. Things that they stay the same, although you change as well, but you, you think that they are that person. And the moment you realize that they are not that person that you fall in love with anymore, you feel this, a huge disappointment. So it's all about this type of process into love relationship. 
and is really inspired by this uh, Italian Italian director Antonini mm -hmm. about uh, this love couple. I think the movie is called The Ski, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. about this girl waiting, a character played by uh, Alain Delon. Okay. She's looking for this guy and he never show up. Mm -hmm. okay. And the, the, the wedding, and for me, the wedding happened during uh, a wedding. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, and my whole album cover is like the, the moment of the wedding, she didn't show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the album cover is that, the, the video clip is about mm -hmm. they both wedding. <laughs> and the husband is in blue, right? If I remember well. Yeah. So the they, they're both in blue. They both, both in blue, right? in blue yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And the short, for the love. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and, and the short movie Zombie, which is uh, you mentioned earlier, which is a high point of your artistic career, right? You won many prizes. It puts forward yeah, yeah. several themes related to technology in the ur urban world in the, the Congo region. When I say Congo region, I mean the phonological Congo, not yeah. with, not with a K. I love so that. You hear it. Can you explain us more about this relationship between technology and tradition and more generally about past, present, and maybe future in, in the region? Wow, it's a very vast question. Um, Just summarized. <laughs> yeah, I would say that um, I'm fascinated about it's been, I already had an EP called 64 Beats and Malachite mm -hmm. a few years ago, and it's questioning our relationship with phone and technology and knowing that i mean my music is made with my laptop we transfer otherwise it doesn't exist um, and 40 percent of my laptop coming from drc in terms of material used to make it work mm -hmm. and then the, the way people perceive apple is like almost a cult Mm. Um, fascination which is very interesting about the human being the human race i didn't dare to say human race but we can say it. it's yeah. very fascinating about the human race um and on the same time there is this tone called malachi that has no value <laughs> and, except it's the only riches of the congolese soul that doesn't doesn't have any value. And I'm fascinated about the way we interact with technology and Congo is not escaping from that. So I wanted to incorporate our look on technology and how the selfie culture, the whole, um, on the, um, oh shit, uh, I don't know, it's, it's uh, endorphin. Uh, um, oh, I think it's the same world. I'm not even sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. That gives How the you brain the, uh, generates the uh, substance, the chemicals we need. No, uh, uh, we, I think you use also dopamine. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. dopamine that gives you this good feeling, energy, this effect of chocolate or stuff like that for your brain. And I thought it was very fascinating. And even in Congo, that is so powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very interesting subject matter but to be honest with you for me th this film is basically <laughs> it's basically a metaphor of Vincent Bolloré mm -hmm. <laughs> because he's the main character of this film mm -hmm. and I use the um, technology part as what, uh, what you can see in the beginning of the film you have full full screen you have these words and i think it's interesting you say click bet mm. and i'm doing the beginning of the film as a click bet because people can engage more easily about phone and people dancing in the club and flirting blah 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 and it's but the real subject matter is coming after five minutes <laughs> yeah true yeah i remember the, the watching the first time the slow beginning, where is it going, and the connections appear then, yeah. Yeah, it's really, for me, the, the key was really, that's even my main motivation was my experience with this label and what, what mean the work of people like Vincent Bolloré, what the, the power that they had, mm -hmm. they, they still have on African culture, arts, economy, yeah. yeah. 
yeah, it's huge. Thank you. And uh, the rapper Yusufa, who's based in Paris, also mm -hmm. reflects quite extensively on, on notions of identity, right? You kind of do it too in your work. Mm -hmm. uh, and he does it both, uh, both through references to Negritude, you know, the blackness movement initiated mm -hmm. by Fanon, Césaire, that he actually quotes in his songs sometimes. But he also does it via the use of Congolese rumba samples from the times of his father during the early, you know, 60s and uh, Congolese mm -hmm. rumba was starting to really emerge and using, for instance, types of guitar riffs that you also make uh, use of in several of your songs, right? So what connection do you put between maybe Yusufa and your work, but also between uh, what sense do you give to this use of Congolese rumba samples, even though your genre has not always anything to do with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that um, I'm fascinated by uh, Congolese guitar. And I will say for two reasons. The first one is, um, so I'm Congolese growing up in Europe, listening a lot of hip hop, a lot of Afro-American music. And most of the time when there was a guitar in, in a hip hop song, that was always awful, always a mistake, like bad taste. Even some good bands, when they put a guitar, it was always wrong, bad sounds. And for so me, a guitar was connected to white music in a way, yeah. um, to rock music, uh, something that black people could not really deal with it, which is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I dig in Congolese music, because my guitar player is 74 years old, and he's been playing with all this legend that you mentioned from this music. He's been playing for, he has 53 years of career. So he's really, and he's just like showing, explaining me like guitar is the main instrument of Congolese music. Hmm. And, I, and when he told me this, I was fascinated about it. Like, wow, but this, it's not a white instrument, it's just the way that you play it that can be perceived like this. And then the more I work, I listen to it, because I, I hate Congolese music growing up, because it was the music of my parents. So it's like you, they ask you to listen to French chanson from the 70th of Johnny Hallyday, you don't want to listen to that, it's like for your parents. So for me, Congolese music was like, no way. Mm -hmm. But um, then I understood one day the beauty of it, and I think it's a dichotomy music between something close to dexterity of of Brazilian heavy metal. Yeah, it, it requests technically so much mm -hmm. because the notes are so short and the distance between the notes are so big, so it, it requires a dexterity that is amazing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's sad and happy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this way of playing is totally unique. I never heard anything like this, and I probably will never hear anything like that. So sonically, it's... I, I call it or February is just like so precise, yeah. so well structured that we need to be proud of this culture because that's something that any other culture do. We have to just like American people as proud of the soul singer, the soul music, and I decide one day, fuck it. <laughs> We also have something to be proud. So I, I, the more I can, I always put some Congolese guitar in it because it's something that nobody can take it from us. So it's part of the pride, right? It's part of like renewing the... Yeah, it's also an identity and it's such a unique sound. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's very special because like I said, it's really dexterity. It's almost... Uh, I know some Japanese guy coming from, there is a documentary about them coming from uh, Osaka to study Congolese guitar and they spent five years studying that Congolese guitar. They even made some records with some uh, Papa Wimba in the, in the 90s. So it's in interesting to listen to those people, how they study this Congolese guitar. It's very fascinating.
Yeah. Okay. And to kind of jump back on that, um, your, one of your first big songs were, uh, was Le Jour d'Après, right? Which is a cover yeah. of a very old rumba songs, Independence Cha Cha, which was also a celebration of the independence. Yeah. Uh, just connecting to that, do you consider yourself as um, also politically engaged through your artistic work? And if so, to what, up to what point and according to what standards? I'm saying that because Independence Cha Cha was definitely a political song in a way, right? There was, yeah, it is. and Le Jour d'Après, the rap you talk about also has a commentary on that song and the history of the region up to now. I think uh, Independence Cha Cha, is the first song that create this Congolese tradition of so something that is called libanda. So that means dedication, dedication mm -hmm. to somebody in a song for some money. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's basically the first song ever. And it's like you have, let's say on an American scale, you have a song that says, I love you, Trump. You're fantastic. I love you, Biden. You are genius. I love you, uh, you know, yeah. some Republican that you hate, that you love, and you, you say that you love everybody. Was it Lumumba who used that first? Oh, yeah, but that song is saying some people that is saying that it's mentioning everybody just to please everybody. Yeah. And this this settle the tradition that we're going to see in the 60s, 70s, 80s, till now, mm -hmm. people pay sometimes a lot of money to get their name mentioned. I and it changed the, the whole structures of the songs. <laughs> I, I think um, somebody uh, from Extra Musica, you know, International from Paris, yeah. sent me an audio at the beginning of the COVID. I think I sent that to you. And it was the COVID-19 song, and there was a lot of Levanga in it, like saying, in the middle of, do not wear a mask or social distance. And in the middle of that, you had a few advertisements. That was really surprising. Yeah, cool. It's also but, because that, that created an economy, because it's a country that doesn't have um, publishing right. So they don't have publishing. They don't have any, any of those things. So they need to make, they, they don't have traditional labels, they, so you need to make money out of it and to make it doable, yeah, so. <laughs> well, thank you, Belogy, for all these answers and for your time. Uh, I would like to finish with one question that may also be a good introduction for the talk that's happening soon uh, at the symposium. And the question is just what projects are you currently working on? We touched on that a little bit, but, and, and I think you will tell us more about your relationship with the whole creation process during the pandemic, during the symposium, cool. right? So that we keep that question for later, but what projects yeah. just generally are you oh, working on? I'm working on a lot of things, but uh, my main uh, focus is on my first feature film. Mm -hmm. And I finally got some money to make it. So I hope that we can shoot in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, so around that feature film, uh, I'm doing a soundtrack, like uh, uh, a record, a collection of songs about those characters, uh, which I'm really talking on their point of view, on their perspective, two males, two females. So it's an extremely challenging project for me. I never did anything like that. so. I think it's a challenge and I'm making two other short films and yeah so that that's kept me very busy okay cool well I think we can tell you thank you and au revoir et à bientôt and we'll see you at the we talk very soon see you